afternoon, everyone. We're going to call the uh, meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board at, in 2019. It's been a few weeks since we've been together because of the holidays, so happy 2019. I have a couple of scheduling announcements. Um, First, for our scheduled meetings for the month of January, I do have a change on uh, Wednesday, January 23rd. We will not be hearing from the qualified health plans on their standard plan design, but on the next week, we will be hearing a presentation from the folks at DIVA on the qualified health plans. So that, that um, press release will be updated on our website. Um, Next week, we're uh, going to hear, we're going to have a panel discussion on strategies to reduce costs and improve quality in healthcare. We have um, a Skype visit from folks at Gunderson Healthcare in Wisconsin, is it? I think it was somewhere in the Midwest. Um, and then we have some of our uh, leaders from hospitals in Vermont who will discuss uh, strategies to um, improve quality and reduce cost in healthcare. It should be an interesting discussion. Um, and then we're also going to hear from folks in the administration on healthcare workforce. And then the next week on Wednesday, January 23rd, we'll hear um, about the ACO certification eligibility verification and new criteria, which we are hearing about today that will be out for a couple of weeks for public comment and there's a potential vote on that day um, I do want to just also mention in terms of our schedule next Wednesday evening from 5 to 7 p.m. at our offices at 144 State Street will be uh, conducting the primary care advisory group meeting and um, the focus of that meeting will uh, be uh, on the reimagined HRAP, and those uh, providers are providing a lot of input on t into that project. So that is a also an open public meeting, and all of the materials are on our website. And that's all I have to announce. Thank you, Susan. Um, just one additional announcement that I'll make is that um, we have not had a public meeting for a couple of weeks due to the holidays. But that didn't mean that the work stopped. And one of the things that occurred in that time frame was the request from Governor Scott for uh, re-evaluation of Vermont's eight critical access hospitals. And our initial report um, has just been sent to uh, the governor and will be on our website later this afternoon as soon as um, our staff has a chance to uh, get back to the office and do that. Um, so with that, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Monday, <coughs> December 17th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Monday, December 17th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? OK. So we're going to proceed with the agenda, and the first item on the agenda is a discussion of our uh, HIE consent policy, and we'll welcome the uh, team from AHS to come forward, and Michael and Steve, welcome. Thank you for having us. Is this... Uh, catching my voice. Um, we're here to report on the progress of, of DIVA's uh, inquiry into whether or not the VHI should continue on with an opt-in uh, consent policy uh, uh, that applies to whether or not an individual's health records are accessible on the, on the exchange uh, by participating providers, or whether we should consider uh, switching to an opt-out policy. Um, yes. So some of the background is that in, uh, in um, under Act 73, uh, there was a com comprehensive review conducted of uh, the VHI, the Vermont Health Information Exchange, um, which uh, was 
conducted by an organization called Health Tech Solutions, which has expertise in uh, health uh, information exchange technology, law, um, and um, operations in, in many states. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues identified by Health Tech in its analysis, which was submitted to the legislature in November of last, well, not last year now, uh, 2017, um, uh, was a suggestion that the VHI's uh, efforts to Im improve and to expand to include a greater proportion of records as accessible by the participating providers was perhaps impeded uh, by the model of consent uh, that we use, which is an opt-in uh, policy. As of that time, the health records of only 19% of Vermonters uh, were accessible in the VHI. Uh, well below what uh, would be considered useful to providers who use uh, the exchange. So in, uh, in the following year, Act 187 uh, was passed, which uh, charged the Debar Department of Vermont Health Access um, with um, uh, the, the uh, undertaking of examining the issue and consulting with uh, stakeholders um, and making some recommendations to various legislative committees uh, about whether or not to continue on with opt-in or to consider opt-out. Um, just to make sure we're all using the same language in the same way, just want to pause for a second and talk about what we mean by opt-in when we say that term or opt-out. Um, opt-in uh, is it presumes that consent is withheld unless stated otherwise and for the VHI this means that a patient's records are accessible only if a patient expressly indicates that I want my records in and accessible opt-out presumes that consent is granted unless stated otherwise and for the VHI this would mean that a patient's records are accessible in the VHI unless the patient expressly indicated that they didn't want their records um, to uh, be accessible. Both mechanisms are, are valid ways to express or withhold consent. Um, I don't think there's any, uh, th there's any real debate about whether or not these mechanisms are valid or invalid one as compared to the other. Um, they're just two different ways of getting at the question of whether or not an individual wants to consent or withhold consent to some question. We started our uh, examination of the issue by looking at um, what some other states um, are doing in this area. Um, Health Tech, uh, when it uh, assessed the VHI in 2017, um, also was making its recommendations in light of what it has observed to be successful exchanges in other states. Uh, we thought, uh, you know, looking at what other states are doing in this area might be illuminating. Um, when we did, we, we quickly found that the vast majority of states um, that have statewide exchanges either have opt-out consent or no consent requirement at all. And you might ask, well, how could they have no consent requirement? And the, the simple answer to that is that federal law governs how uh, healthcare information is accessible and exchangeable and uh, communicable among parties. Um, I'm sure most of you have um, heard of the privacy and security rules under HIPAA, uh, which uh, squarely address how health information can be um, shared between healthcare system participants. Um, the states that don't have con state level consent policies just default to the protections uh, that are already uh, existing in HIPAA. Um, so this me so it was 43 um, out of the excuse me 33 out of the 41 states that we identified as having um, statewide HIEs health in information exchanges. Uh, use opt-out or no consent at all. Four further ones use a combination of opt-out with, uh, generally, uh, but with opt-in uh, for specific types of medical information that might warrant a more restrictive approach, uh, or 
with respect to certain populations like private insurance covered uh, individuals. Um, only three states besides Vermont use a Vermont-like uh, uh, opt-in um, uh, model. It's worth noting that Health Tech Solutions, um, you know, in its in its evaluation of successful states for the purpose of comparison with how Vermont was doing, um, you know, showed that um, all nine successful HIEs that they sort of lifted up as models for success use opt out, and some of those states use opt out um, uh, models that that um, you know create even you know increase barriers to opting out so create a stronger presumption that records are, are shareable within the exchanges um, which brings me to my next point as we looked across the nation at, at how states are doing this uh, the vast majority of them are using opt-out um, and uh, and they're not all the same flavor um, part of the reason we were doing this inquiry is because um, Vermont law requires um, the uh, standards that are uh, adopted for the exchange to be in alignment with national standards. So we were trying to discern whether or not there was, um, a, you know, a single national standard. Um, while um, there was some variation and not all states hewed to a single standard, um, obviously the vast majority of them used opt-out. And the different sort of levels of um, sort of um, uh, stringency were uh, defined by what process was necessary to express your intention to opt out as, a, as an individual. Some uh, made it easy for individuals to opt out by providing online options. Um, others had to be paper forms, had to be submitted by fax. Uh, others further. Um, uh, restricted it to to um, to require uh, notarizations or provider counter signatures uh, on their forms electing uh, of election to opt out. Uh, four of the states um, in among the nine successful HIEs uh, require notarization, so that that creates a strong presumption of uh, record inclusivity in the exchange and exchangeability. Um, after, yeah, of course. So, thanks, Steve. Michael Costa, Deputy Commissioner of DIVA. And I just, um, I, as Steve goes through as our general counsel and kind of gets you through the weeds of where we've been and where we're going, <clears throat> I don't want to lose sight of a bigger point. We came before this board in the legislature starting in 2017 because the HIE program was not performing very well. We have done everything we can to try to maximize our chances for success in HIE as a program and as a driver of success and innovation in healthcare in Vermont. And that's been a combination of things. We've tried to provide more leadership, uh, grateful to Mike Smith and folks at Vital who've stepped up and tried to be good leaders of that program. Um, grateful for the board for considering and approving the HIE plan at the end of last year. Uh, we've tried to be more focused and do a better job of saying what we want and why we want it. And, and now we're trying to have a real focus on execution. Um, we've done everything the legislature has asked of us through very Act 73 and Act 187. And uh, we'll see if we're able to execute on the tactical plan that was included in the HIE plan you approved. Through that inquiry, thinking about what are the type of things that will maximize our chances for success in HIE, I would say, from my own opinion, the experience of consent policies in other states that Stephen just described stands out, sticks out like a sore thumb. Vermont is clearly uh, have clearly has a minority position on consent. We are doing it differently than almost every other state, and particularly different than states that have had some success in HIE, according to the national experts. And so the question is, the big picture policy question is why. What benefit are you getting in exchange for having a minority position that, um, in my opinion, has served as a headwind for having access to records? And so I, I think it's appropriate now to go back to Stephen and, and get through what's going to be in our report, which is due to the legislature, but I just don't want the bigger picture issue to be lost as we do that. Clearly, I should have let Michael speak first. Um, a much better framing of the uh, of the issue than uh, uh, than than I did by just launching into things. Um, 
But with that said, I will continue forward. Um, so we uh, we talked to stakeholders um, who um, uh, are reflected on the on on the slide here. Um, for those that uh, may have difficulty reading it, we we spoke to uh, Vital, uh, which is the operator uh, of of the uh, of the VHI, uh, the Office of Healthcare Advocate, the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, on a, a number of occasions, the ACLU of Vermont, Bi-State Primary Care Association, which represents the uh, FQHC community, uh, the Vermont Medical Society, uh, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, the Medicaid uh, and Exchange Advisory Board, uh, which has a number of uh, uh, constituents across the healthcare system in Vermont, the Primary Care Advisory Board, uh, more informally, um, and the uh, DIVA HIE HIT Steering Committee, uh, which has representation from private pay insurers, the, uh, the Vermont's single accountable care organization, um, Vermont Care Partners representing the designated agencies, uh, and so forth. So it was a, it, it was a broad outreach effort, uh, and um, th the outcome was that you know, the, the, the vast majority of stakeholders support opt-out for many of the reasons that uh, Michael described. Um, they generally believe that uh, it supports um, increased accessibility to records. You know, the, uh, the administrative burdens under the existing system are necessarily manual uh, and cumbersome. Uh, and as a consequence, they, it, you know, uh, providers just don't ask for consent. Uh, and it's led to uh, a, 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 an unacceptably low number of Vermonters even being asked the question of whether or not they want their records uh, in. Um, they, uh, they observe that, um, that of the people who are asked, 95% of them uh, indicate they want their records in, so they feel like um, a, uh, a, a system of consent that presumes inclusion is more in alignment with um, the uh, uh, desires of Vermonters on the issue, uh, and they're comfortable uh, that you know switching from one consent policy to another or one model to another uh, wouldn't in any way degrade uh, patient privacy and autonomy. Um, you know, in in some ways, you know, to the contrary, and I'll go into that a little bit more in detail. Uh, stakeholders opposing the change uh, were limited to two. Uh, it was the uh, Office of Vermont. Uh, health healthcare advocate um, and the ACLU of Vermont, uh, both of whom expressed a desire to uh, stick with the uh, the, the uh, current uh, policy. Um, the uh, healthcare advocate um, uh, it was you know, didn't really go into detail about the the uh, underlying reasoning supporting their position. Uh, we tried to understand how they were balancing privacy interests against the health care interests of Vermonters, which arguably would be supported by a high-functioning exchange. Um, um, but uh, there, there wasn't much uh, uh, that we learned uh, as we tried to get clarification around that. Um, but um, the, uh, the ACLU also preferred uh, to stick with the, the policy, like the healthcare advocate, they shared a sort of a generalized uh, notion that um, moving to opt out would somehow be less protective of privacy and autonomy than than sticking with opt in. Although, again, it was difficult to understand exactly how that conclusion uh, worked. Um, the ACLU, though, I think, uh, sort of understands that that um, you know which way the wind is blowing uh, and. Uh, that uh, across the country, uh, systems are recognizing the need to use an opt-out uh, consent if they choose to use one at all. Uh, and they focus most of their comments uh, and feedback on sort of the practical considerations of how we would implement uh, a switch to a different system. You know, wanting uh, to ensure that there was, uh, you know, multiple instances of, of notice, patient notice and uh, publicity around it. Uh, um, you know, rigorous provider training, uh, an implementation plan with plenty of time for anybody who wanted their records to be excluded uh, to, to, you know, to take the action necessary before the effectiveness of a switch. Um, um, so one of the things that um, 
there were a couple of themes that that that, that kept coming up. Um, one was this, uh, you, you know, this idea. You know, is security um, of health in information some would it be subject to compromise or, or weakened in some way uh, under a different policy? Um, other questions uh, came up about what are the legislative uh, implications, if any, um, uh, to, to making a change? Um, and, and what fundamentally do most Vermonters want and are, is, our, is our policy aligned with that? Um, um, relating to security um, and you know, having consulted with uh, the, the experts who operate the VI, uh, it's clear that the existing security features in the VI are robust and they meet all of the applicable requirements for security and that changing the model of consent would have absolutely no impact whatsoever uh, on the, the security features that protect information reposed in the VI. Um, no, no system safeguards would be altered in any way. So it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a little bit misleading to think about uh, a change in consent uh, as having any impact whatsoever on the security of records uh, within within the uh, uh, the system. Relating to the question of, uh, of whether or to what extent legislative action uh, might be required, um, our analysis uh, determined that there's no Vermont statute that governs uh, whether or what kind of consent would be required from a patient for their records to be exchangeable as contemplated within the, within the, the HIE. Um, <clears throat> some folks have argued in the past um, before there was a little bit greater clarity in the law, um, and I'll get to that in a second, that the patient privilege statute in Vermont, which is a Title 12 uh, statute, um, it, you know, conferred some, some manner of broad uh, medical records privacy rights on Vermonters. Um, <clears throat> the Supreme Court uh, in 2016 uh, clarified that that is just not the case, um, that um, the, the scope of that statute is really limited to judicial proceedings only. Uh, and it is. It does not confer a broad uh, right of uh, privacy and medical records beyond um, uh, judicial proceedings. It really and the, that uh, also sort of squares with the plain meaning of the statute, which is about qualifications of witnesses to testify at trial. Um, there are also some some folks who've, who've uh, over time thought maybe the involuntary mental health hospitalization statute uh, under Title 18, you know, may require some form of express written consent. Um, that's inapposite as well. It's reading it too broadly to, to, uh, um, to um, think that it would require um, patient consent generally. Um, and the kinds of records that are uh, addressed by that statute are not in the VHI anyway, and nor do we plan them to be. Uh, at any point, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, um, while we address some, I guess, technical uh, constraints. Um, the only source of authority for this, um, for this policy uh, is in the Green Mountain Care Board and, and Agency of Administration approved policy uh, on patient consent. I'm not going to read the whole title of it. It's a mouthful. Um, but that policy, which the board, in connection and in conjunction with the agency of administration, has the power to change, um, is uh, is where um, the uh, the model resides. The consent model resides. What the Green Mountain Care Board can enact into policy, it can change as well. Um, you know this uh, this policy. You know under the the statute that governs the health information technology plan is incorporated into that plan, um, and it's important to remember that the 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 title or the statutory provision that re that requires the development of standards around privacy 
um, requires them to be in alignment with national standards. Um, so bottom line, no legislative action ne necessary. Um, <clears throat> the, other, the other point that kept coming up is, is uh, you know, what about, what about the people? You know, we, we have these conversations about consent, and sometimes we, f we tend to f forget that it's been demonstrated time and again that the vast majority of Vermonters not only want their information in, many of them assume that it's already in and accessible. Um, as of late December, of the 217,000 Vermonters asked, over 95% want their records accessible in the VHI um, by other providers who may have uh, uh, you know, occasion to treat them. Um, that means that about 63% of Vermonters have not even been asked in large part because of the administrative burdens and costs associated with the, the current opt-in policy. None of their records are exchangeable uh, in the VI. Um, under opt-out, uh, records of approximately two-thirds of patients would be accessible upon implementation of a new policy, which takes us into um, you know, the range of of critical mass of records accessibility uh, that's the hallmark of high functioning exchanges. I know that you know we've tried to be really transparent in our thinking and our process here um, and what has come up several times when we show this statistic is hey if 95% of the people ask say yes you just need to ask more people and, and what I would say to folks is hey look we are asking for a lot out of primary care providers and other health care providers in this state. We've got Medicare commercial insurers and Medicaid asking them to do things. We have Blueprint asking them to do things. The ACO asking them to do things, various quality reporting measures. You know, what is gained by spending time and effort trying to modify the administrative process regarding consent when the experience of other states, by and large, is to just create an opt-out? So just simply show me the value in spending time optimizing that process compared to myriad other things that we could be asking healthcare providers to do, not least of which is spend more time with your patients and less time on administrative burden. The final thing I would note uh, is that, you know, if we care about patient autonomy, which we do, um, you know, one way to look at that is is to ensure that our policies support the implementation of the wishes of the most Vermonters. Um, what's clear is that an opt-out policy uh, would be would produce results much more in alignment with um, the uh, the will of the vast majority of Vermonters, and also. Uh, it would more than um, accommodate the wishes of those who desired to opt out. Opt out. In either case, it you know either transaction, opting in or opting out, requires the engagement of the of the person making the, the choice. Whether they implement that choice by doing something or electing not to do something um, is is uh, you know doesn't determine whether. You know the the validity of of their consent. Um, they're both equally valid mechanisms. One gets us a lot closer to reflecting the 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 will of Vermonters than the other. So it should come as no surprise <laughs> that our uh, our preliminary recommendation, as we've as we've thought about this, uh, you know, over the the past many months, uh, and had all these conversations with. Uh, the healthcare community is is that we will we'll be recommending uh, the implementation uh, of an opt-out consent model uh, in replacement of the current one, which has uh, proven so lacking in so many significant respects. Um, we, uh, in doing so, though, we can certainly take into account um, some of the concerns of those who oppose a change um, by. Number one, making it really easy to opt out uh, in whatever policy we uh, develop, uh, and you know supporting that with whatever uh, we need to. Uh, for example, um, you know to 
we would recommend um, you know no hurdles of uh, notarization or provider counter signature or things like that we try to make it as easy as possible um, and we would implement it in a way that allowed uh, for a long lead time uh, that, uh, to ensure that anybody who wanted to be out was 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 informed, had actual notice, had an opportunity to consider what their wishes were, and had the opportunity to implement that before uh, the change took effect. Um, that said, um, our final uh, recommendations uh, and report w won't be submitted until next week. Um, and we came here in part today uh, to hear if there was if there are any uh, you know other thoughts out there that we should consider as we formulate uh, our final recommendation. Um, so, with that, I'll 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 ask the board, or uh, I don't know how you solicit audience. So we first go through the board questions. And okay. We turn to the public. So, uh, members of the board, do you have any questions? I have a, Robin. a question and a comment. Um, on the previous slide, first of all, thank you for coming, and it's good to see you here. Um, on the previous slide, you indicated approximately two-thirds of patients' records would be accessible. Who are the other one-third, or can you talk a little bit about the one-third that would not be accessible? Um, I really wish Emily were up here, because she knows the identity of that one-third. Um, you can call her friends. <laughs> yeah, can I? There she is, right there. Or that, that figure, I'll just say, in turn, if I don't want to um, respond, is based on um, the previous data point that Vital gave uh, the Green Mountain Care Board a couple of years ago about 65% of Vermont patients were accessible in the Beehive. So, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'll, of course, I'll turn to Vital, but I think we all know that not every provider that has an electronic health record, so it's not always going to capture every single patient, and just not every single patient has either seen a physician that's connected to the Beehive or seen a physician at all. So we're always going to have to. If I may, if I may, Emily, when we think about success, we think of a numerator, which is how many record, how many individual Vermonters records are accessible in the VI, and a denominator that is all Vermonters. Uh, changing the consent policy is not a panacea, but it is progress, and our hypothesis is that changing it would allow us potentially to get that numerator to a place where about two-thirds of Vermonters would have accessible health records in the VI. If I've misspoken, feel free to. Uh, Michael Sanders, uh, interim uh, president of the Vermont Health Services Remember, we have about one third in the VI right now. <laughs> Got it. So what explains it, just to recap, if if the recording didn't catch it, is um, you know providers who don't have uh, electronic health records systems or who may not be participating in the VHI, patients of those providers represent about one third of Vermonters. So. Um, Respecting Michael's point, the denominator is all Vermonters. Um, but um, if the denominator were those that we could reasonably expect to be in the exchange, um, we'd be doing a lot better than 65 percent uh, by changing the policy. Okay, and certainly even with this change, it doesn't impact uh, the federal rules around Part Two information. So even if that person's consent was assumed under a change in the policy, that protected data would still remain protected. That, that is correct. Uh, part two records are not um, in the VHI, uh, and nothing uh, in our recommendation addresses part two information. Um, we're sort of uh, proceeding on a status quo basis relating to part two. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully that problem will be solved at the federal level uh, when they see fit to conform part two uh, in greater alignment with what HIPAA provides. Thank you. Um, so my comment is, um, I, I just wanted to say personally that um, I, I like the opt-in. I know we're not necessarily discussing or making any decisions, but just in terms of giving you feedback. I personally think the opt-in is the right, I mean the opt, yes, I'm gonna confuse myself. <laughs> I think changing the policy makes sense so that we are opting, so that there's an opt-out. Thank you. Um, but I, 
to me, part of that is tied to what VITAL currently does today. And certainly under their new strategic plan, there are some new areas that they might be looking to expand into and some new private partnerships uh, that obviously at this point are unknown. But I think for me, part of what has to be clear is what the data can and cannot be used for. And I personally do not feel that HIPAA is sufficiently protected because it does allow the sale of de-identified data for profit uh, making purposes and in the past that has been used then uh, specifically in the clearest example I have is by pharmaceutical companies to re-identify the data essentially and then use that to change provider practicing behavior so I do think there are some privacy issues I agree the security security is good you know I don't think there are security issues but I think that there could be privacy issues if we stuck with a HIPAA type model and there weren't additional considerations there. So that's my feedback for no, you, Speaker Lee. I, I appreciate your feedback, and I, I, would, I would just respond by saying that in addition to the requirements of HIPAA, um, the VHI itself and VITAL has adopted policies um, that f place further constraints on the use of, in, of the healthcare information within. I, I'm not uh, certain about what the parameters are around the use of de-identified information, uh, but, um, and I guess I won't assume, um, but I think that we have room to work to address your concerns if indeed um, our policies are, are uh, you know, falling short in any respect. Absolutely. I agree. It, to it could certainly be addressed in a consent policy document, so that's partially why I wanted to say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. Other questions? I just had one, and I mean, I think it's a really compelling case to do the opt-out. My challenge would be if we think it's going to be easy for people who do want to take the to actually opt out. I mean, I think that this option is compelling, but we're saying we're going to make it easy for them to be able to opt out. You know, someone could say, why wasn't it easy for them to opt in when we wanted to do it? And I know we've had a real struggle getting people to opt in. And I just think we have to be really careful saying, you know, if people want to opt out, it's going to be easy to do because the devil's advocate would say, well, then let's just make it easy to opt in. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. It is a really fair question. <clears throat> I'm not sure why it's so hard. All I know is sitting in my position as the administration's executive sponsor on HIE is that we've had this policy for a number of years and it hasn't created the scale and participation that we would like. There potentially are a lot of reasons why, and I don't know them. I just know that the proof is that we haven't got there. Um, I think when it comes to making sure we have the appropriate opt-out policy, and we share your concern that it needs to be effective and it needs to be easy, um, what I would do in working with other stakeholders and with the board is to, for example, take something like our ACO opt-out policy, which we presently administer, and, and we think it's run fairly well, and say, we would try to make something as easy as this. You know, what particular concerns do you have as regulators or advocates or, or other members of the public with that process? So for example, in the ACO opt-out, we sent, just this past week, we sent letters to over 40,000 Vermonters and uh, gave them clear instructions on how to opt out and a small number will take advantage of that. And so we'd be happy to propose some sort of straw model and get feedback on how folks think that should work most appropriately. I would add to that that even even if um, the um, implementation of opt out the, the the administrative you know sort of back office burden is the same per transaction the fact that there are likely to be or sure to be so many fewer instances in which a provider would be called upon to do anything at all. Um, out of every hundred patients they see, only four or five are gonna are, are gonna be uh, e exercising their opt out rights. Um, that's something that is uh, you know is welcome news to the provider community, and I think they're much more likely to um, participate in giving uh, giving effect to the consent policy if it only asks them to do something four or five times out of a hundred rather than. 95 or 96 times out of 100. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Um, 
I guess I would first of all say you pretty much had me at hello because um, I'm a strong supporter of revising the consent policy with some of the caveats that I've already mentioned and how the data is used and actually how somebody can opt out. But I thought I'd just give a little, and for people who don't maybe know this literature, there's plenty of literature in the field of behavioral economics that actually talks about people have a default bias. So no matter what the default is, people will find that more attractive. And even experiments that randomly assign what's the default, people will go to the default. And so whether, and there's, you know, economists have speculated that that could be some sort of uh, cognitive, uh, you know, cognitive difficulty in changing away from the, from the default. It may be that people just believe that whoever has designed the model or the policy assumes that the default is better, so they're the easy way out. There's lots of economic kind of reasons for why people choose the default, but it's well known in the literature that whatever is the default is what people are gonna, you know, are biased towards. And you can look at a really prime example of this is organ donation. So you look at a country like Germany that has opt-in, as we do in the US, and only about, I think the number is 12% of people opt in to donate their organs. You flip that and you look at Austria that has opt out, and 99% of people consent to donate their organs. It's a huge swing. And so, and there's plenty of other examples in policy around how people opt in and opt out of even savings, retirement plans through their workplace. It changes the default and it changes behavior very, very significantly. So, given the concerns that we've had about the VHI and getting folks enrolled or consented and into the VHI, their data, I'm a huge proponent of this, and I would say so. You know, it's, it's great to see that we don't have to necessarily go through a long process to think about it's, if it's in the Green Mountain Care Board's consent policy, I would say let's explore that from our end because clearly opt-in policies are, have been proven costly and ineffective and opt-out would be, I think, the way out to get uh, more people into the system. Uh, and I would also just say people do get confused opt-in, opt-out, and it is very confusing. It's easier sometimes to just say presumed consent. Presumed consent is opt out, and that's just easier to remember. It's presumed consent, I'm, just, I'm presuming that you consent. So anyway, I just might throw that out there, that people are having remember, trouble remembering, it may be easier to use presumed consent as a language. So, it's a huge supporter, and I'd like to see what we can do. Super, so a couple of questions. In your research for the report, um, you mentioned a number of states uh, have no consent policy. Can you tell me if there have been um, uh, lawsuits in those states that have been uh, quite contentious or if there have been any um, adverse effects to um, the individuals who are subject to that uh, uh, ability to declare what their true intention is. Yeah, our research uh, did not flag any uh, increased, uh, you know, incidents of um, sort of bad outcomes to use a sort of generic way of phrasing it in states that, that uh, didn't have a state level uh, consent policy. Uh, and certainly um, the same is true for opt out. Um, we, didn't, we didn't see that data now. That wasn't a primary focus of our inquiry. Um, and so uh, you know, I would have to go back and hone in on that to give you a more definitive uh, uh, answer. Um, at this point, we're going to turn it over to the public for any comments. Um, if you could stand up and say your name and then uh, address your comments through the board. Yep, you. <laughs> um, I hope I can be heard without a microphone. Is that all right? Um, you can, as long as you keep up that volume, we can do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so for the record, my name is Kirsten Murphy. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, I would say up front that I, I don't enjoy disagreeing with Mr. Costa. I usually agree with him. Um, and um, we offer these comments in a spirit of trying to make your health reform effort successful. Um, for context, the council is composed of 60% individuals with developmental disabilities and their family caregivers. Developmental disabilities are significant lifelong conditions and impact 18.4% of the population or roughly one in five Americans. Councils exist in every state and territory with the federal mandate that we advocate for policies that advance the independence, productivity, self-determination, and community inclusion of people with developmental disabilities 
What's at stake for us today is the self-determination component, the right of people to, whether they have a developmental disability or not, to make decisions for themselves and not be com compelled to, uh, uh, into decisions. The council is concerned that a shift to an opt-out consent policy would degrade patient privacy. For the population we represent, which generally has a low level of health literacy, shifting the burden from provider to consumer would compromise the ability of people with developmental disabilities to make an informed decision about their personal health information. I have a few specific points. One would be the need for broader stakeholder input. Um, in my review of the current consent policy, it's my understanding that protected health information subject to the Green Mountain Care Board policy includes mental health communication and might in the future even include substance use disorder. Now since these are unfortunately stigmatized conditions, it's reasonable to assume that consumer groups like NAMI or the Vermont Association for Mental Health and Addiction Recovery might have concerns. Um, the list of stakeholders consulted by DIVA didn't happen to include any such group. In fact, most of the groups listed on slide six were provider groups, not patient groups, and that oversight should be corrected. Um, I also feel that today's presentation downplays a little bit the concerns that were expressed by some stakeholders. I spoke with the director of the ACLU yesterday, and I have his permission to say their position is unequivocal. An opt-out policy compromises. Oh. Vermont's right, Vermonters' right to privacy and shouldn't, citizens should not have the burden of opting out imposed on them for the convenience of providers. I was present for the Medicaid and Exchange Advisory Board's meeting and the issue was, uh, the group was so sharply divided we weren't really able to make a meaningful recommendation. Second, it's, it's somewhat misleading to claim that opt out better reflects Vermonters' intent. Opting into the HIE is not the same thing as signaling support for an opt-out approach, as is claimed on slide 11. Just because someone chooses to opt in does not logically mean that they don't want to be asked about their preference. Third point, indicators to date signal that consumers are likely to be confused by or uninformed about their options in an opt-out approach. And with all respect to the good work that VITAL does, they may not yet have reached a point of being fully consumer friendly. Let's start with the fact that provider reluctance to engage consumers in an opt-in scenario indicates that they would be an unreliable point of contact for consumer engagement in an opt-out scenario. So simply put, if providers are burdened by asking patients to opt in, which is in the provider's interest, how likely will they be to inform consumers that they have a right to opt out, uh, which is not in the provider's interest? Um, Today's presentation noted that it should be easy to opt out and the implementation of a change in the policy should be managed with care. I would urge the Green Mountain Care Board to not agree to a change in policy with first reviewing a compelling plan to ensure that consumers understand their options. I have a hard time seeing how such a plan would not still impose some level of burden on the provider since it does take time to explain someone's right to opt out uh, as it might, as it takes time to tell them that they can opt in. I would also note that the processes currently in place for consumers to navigate decisions about their health information are already somewhat confusing and burdensome. The brochure that families can look at or people can look at is not something my constituents would understand. Uh, the forms are confusing um, and have to be co-signed either by your medical provider or, or by your notary if you, if you choose to change your mind, if you want an audit, or if you want to look at your own protected health information. So I think that there's work to be done in becoming more user friendly, especially for people with um, a broad range of health literacy levels. Um, I want to dispute a little the fact that, that there's a sort of national consensus on this. Other states, there are other states that have been successful in implementing an opt-in policy. Um, today's presentation indicated that Vermont's only one of four. I would, not going to quibble with that number, but um, some states that are opt-in states are states with large complex health systems, like New York and Florida. Um, I note that in a press release dated July 27th of 2018, representatives from New York's eHealth Collaborative announced a very successful 10-month campaign that netted 8.8 million patients who affirmatively, affirmatively gave their consent to participate 
in data sharing across the statewide health information network. Um, authorities touted the opt-in approach as showing, quote, higher levels of patient engagement with patients taking the initiative to facilitate better health data exchange between themselves and their providers. Florida's health information exchange seems to be having similar success with articles in the press reporting more than six million Floridians opting in. Vermont might consider uh, what it can learn from successful opt-in states. Finally, I, I want to note that Vermont is really making solid progress using an opt-in approach. So as you heard in the presentation, in November of 2017, in the evaluation of Vermont's health information activities, the Health Tech Solutions Report, only about 19% of people were opting in, 20% were asked and 19 opted in. But more recently, uh, in a report dated January 1st of this year, so just a few weeks ago, Vital delivered a progress report to your board and to the legislature that indicated a significant <coughs> increase in the statewide ask rate. In fact, Vital now exceeded its target with 3.8% of Vermonters opting in. And the trend has been solidly in the direction of greater patient engagement and consent. How has VITAL achieved this significant improvement, and could Vermonters do more of what has begun to work? What is being described as provider burden is a concern, but one that is outweighed by the need to protect the patient's right to determine an acceptable level of privacy. Let's remember that in virtually all cases, consent is solicited at the reception desk, not in the doctor's exam room. Soliciting patient consent is part of delivering fully integrated care. It's an opportunity to engage individual Vermonters in our state's new approach to health care. In closing, I urge the Green Mountain Care Board to proceed cautiously, and I hope we'll ask additional questions, wait for a full report, the full report required by Act 187, and take further public input before making any change to your policy. I'm happy to give you a written copy. Thank you. Other public comments or questions? Yes, um, this one strikes me as complex, and as they were describing opt-in, opt-out, I couldn't help but think of getting my morning cup of coffee, sitting down on my computer this morning, and this little screen pops up and says, I want to snooze for an hour. I click both buttons on my mouse. I hit every button on my keyboard. It wouldn't let me do a thing. And I don't know what the snooze for an hour is about. I didn't know if I, hit, if I clicked that yes, if it was going to fall asleep for an hour when I'm ready to do some work, or if I, nothing happened. I got to use it. I don't know what I agreed to. I have no idea. All I know is it wouldn't let me do anything unless I paid attention to that little screen saying it wants to snooze for an hour. <coughs> This is a little bit like that, opt-in or opt-out, no matter which one you pick. One feels better than the other. I didn't like that feeling this morning of not being able to do anything, in a sense, unless I agreed. And I had no idea what I was agreeing to. Opt-in, if I don't get confused, means I have to choose before anything happens. That, as a consumer, makes me feel better than the, my computer made me feel this morning. Um, here's another, Michael, I'm gonna, same thing, I don't totally agree. You're trying to work a denominator and a numerator and you're trying to get your 20% so you've got enough people to say you, you have sufficient participation how I would go about doing that from their perspective is not what I think the cons really does respect the consumer. I just listened to Mitzi give her speech this morning, and in that speech, she said, let's remember to respect all Vermonters. I don't think this policy will do that and that has me greatly concerned. It doesn't matter that the majority of Vermonters would be in. What matters is, is every population being respected, which includes 
if by numbers it's a minority population, that doesn't matter. Are they going to be respected is meaningful. A healthcare system that doesn't respect all populations is going down a path that I have talked about before. This worries me. People getting siloed, sidestepped, stepped on, disrespected, not seen for their real needs as far as their medical needs, and therefore disrespected. I can do that with the measures as well. If I arrange the measures to look at only certain things, I can have a whole population out there that might measure as being successfully <coughs> given what they need, and they didn't get what they needed because the thing that they really needed, besides what they did get, never got measured. So I almost think this should go before the legislature and actually have a more in-depth look at it because there's more profound issues here that you're considering. I think you're very capable of considering this issue. I'm saying I think it involves so many Vermonters, as it involves all Vermonters, that maybe the board should consider it's that big an issue that it should go beyond the board. And I will leave it at that. Thank you, Dale. Sam? Um, yeah, my name is Sam Liss, and I'm actually a member of the newly restructured um, Green Mountain Care Board General Advisory Committee. And I, I was literally uh, asked at the last minute by the president of Vermont Coalition of Disability Rights uh, to represent VCDR at, at this um, public meeting. VC VCDR uh, comprises approximately 20 disability rights organizations. Rather than repeat um, uh, everything that Kirsten and, and Dale have said, uh, I just, uh, on behalf of VCDR, I just wanted to concur uh, specifically with what um, the executive director of the Developmental Dis uh, uh, Disability Council said in terms of concerns, especially for those that are not as health literate as, as other people might be. Um, I, I myself have full, uh, full um, uh, confidence in the Green Mountain Care Board, but I did want to concur with those concerns uh, in terms of um, making sure that uh, informed consent is required of everyone and is sustained. Okay, Jeff. Um, I, I actually find this very troubling, um, and I was, I, I, I must admit, emotionally um, uh, triggered by your comment about Austria and the opt-out and the opt-in. Um, in terms of organ donation, um, you know, it's, these are, are things that um, I doubt very much that everyone who is on the list of organ donation in Austria really feels that they've been fully informed whether they really want to be there or not. Um, and again, I have emotional reasons for feeling that way, that I do believe it should be an opt-in. I also feel that way in terms of this, and it has to do with informed consent. And the fact is, is that I have trouble as a provider of services, addiction medicine services, getting information on my patients because of HIPAA from other doctors and other nurses. As a result, and I find it really troubling that this information can be gotten just by a, a panel of how many. I agree, I think this needs to be done by the legislature, and I strongly urge you to leave things as they are. This idea of opt-out to me seems very anti-democratic. I think it's against the freedom and rights of, and of individuals, and it's very disturbing to me. Okay, other comments, Eric? My name is Eric Schultes with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. So I have a question and a comment. Could we go back to that slide with the title, 96% of Vermonters want their records accessible? So 
So was the 217,000 Vermonters who were asked, was that a representative sample? I'm not a statistician, but I think that uh, a sample of 217,000 out of 600,000 is likely to meet the threshold. Okay, so, I mean, I'll grant that the end, so the number of people asked is high, but if it's not representative, you can't, it's factually untrue to say 90%, 96% of Vermonters want their records accessible, as is opt-out better reflects Vermonters' intent. That's marketing, not truth. I think as we talk about this, we should think about at what numbers actually mean. And you can't make an inference about a population of 600,000 from 217,000 people if it's not a representative sample. So if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, just since we're invited to respond to a question, um, just going back to Ms. Murphy's public comment, uh, I, I always really appreciate your comments because part of my time at the Agency of Human Services has uh, got me to think about the phrase integrated continuum of care, not just as a thing we talk about, but hard work we do every single day. And so I always appreciate your comment. And then when I took this job, Secretary Gobey only told me two things. One, do the right thing, and two, don't kick the can down the road. So we're always gonna do the right thing. And so we've not tried to mislead anybody. Um, we were happy to update the slides to, to soften the edges of them. Um, I think we tried to be clear with the ACLU that they said no, but we heard it as no, but here are the good things you should think about if this policy is going to be changed. And to the extent some of it seems uh, you know, reaching a little bit, we're happy to change that. But the second part of what Secretary Gobey told me was don't kick the can down the road. I cannot look at the HIE experience of the majority of states and believe that opt-in remains the most effective way to operate the program and to maximize our chances for success and protect the public investment that went into it. I very much appreciate that people will disagree on this point but I just want to be very clear about sort of my viewpoint on it. And the fact that we will take these public comments to heart is we craft the report and presumably, presumably the next slide deck that will go in front of other public policymakers. So Eric and others, thank you for that feedback. So I, I think if I could just put my eye to comment too, I think doing the right thing in this case is basing this decision on what folks want. And I think that is doing a representative sample so it's not to say you guys are doing wrong, it's just let's hear what Vermonters actually want, let's hear what patients actually want, and let's craft an instrument, a survey instrument, to get at this, and it is a complicated question. And we know we can get answers to complicated questions by looking at the Health Informate Household Health uh, Insurance Survey. And I don't see that in this presentation. The comment is, I'm sorry that our office's input wasn't useful, to you, um, we would be happy to talk in the future about that. I want to clarify some of our concerns with the hope that we can move past the it wasn't useful comment. One is I think we share some of the board <coughs> members' concerns that if opting in isn't done right, why should we think opt out will be done right? Like if you can't process opt ins at the provider's office, why would you be, how are you going to be processing opt out? This is somewhat of a personal problem for me, but if you think the main causal reason for not having more participation is burden on providers or somehow them not being able to process this correctly, it seems to me that the solution should be addressing that causal problem and not putting the burden on consumers. And that is another, so that's one reason why we're concerned. We see the issue, we think the solution should address the issue, and not simply put it on the backs of other Vermonters. Thank you. Okay, are there other members of the public with any comments or questions? Susan? I just have a request, which is that it seemed like there was a lot of progress made in a very short amount of time, from like 19% of <laughs> records in to over 38% of records in, in a short amount of time. So I would just request that the board invite Vital to present on, well, what did they do in that less than a year to nearly double the records? Because if they did more of that, 
then maybe maybe they figured out a way to address the provider provider burden or whatever the obstacles were. You know, all of a sudden the heat was really turned up and to really good effect. And so I don't know that this Green Mountain Care Board has enough information yet because something seems to be working and we don't know what that something is. So I would just request um, an additional hearing to get more information. Well, this is not a hearing for this board to make any decisions. We're hearing a report. We make that perfectly clear. Um, and I think there have been some strong arguments made and um, I almost flip it the other way when I listen to my good friend Sam and he's saying that um, he believes that the community that he's representing would have a tougher time with an opt-out policy. I think that they actually may be denied the quality of care that they're entitled to with an opt-in policy. And those are the type of things that, you know, people think that there's this reception area that uh, is there for each patient that walks them through this opt-in policy. And the reality of what we're seeing is that isn't occurring. I can tell you I go to one of the few doctors who doesn't even have a receptionist. Um, probably not a wise decision on my part. Uh, but I doubt that if I was in an accident someplace that my information would be available because I've never been asked to opt in. And I think a number of Vermonters are in that very awkward situation. So this is not a, an easy thing as we move forward. And um, I would just caution everybody that we should work together for a good solution. Um, I don't think anybody's rights are taken away, whether it's opt-in or opt-out necessarily. It's just that it's a different form of burden. So um, you would still be able to protect your information if that was your choice. Hi, yes. jo yeah, Jessa Barnard on behalf of the Vermont Medical Society. So our, our members are physicians and physician assistants across the state, and so we are on the provider side of things. But I just, I do want to weigh in to just thank Michael and Steve for their work on this presentation. I think what we have heard from physicians, and one of the frustrations to Michael's point about sort of the future of the VHI, do we think this is actually a system that can improve the, the health of our state and that it's important when you go to multiple providers for them to be able to talk to each other. When we have low numbers of participations of patients, at least on the vital access side, I think for physicians get so frustrated they don't even use the system. If we only have, whether it's 19%, 30%, 40%, the chance that they go in and find useful information on their patient is so low that they may stop using it altogether and then this isn't serving anyone and whether you've opted in or not opted in opted in. So I, I think the point I would like to make is I really do, our members, our physicians really do want to see progress on this. Um, they want to see more records in, or I shouldn't say in, but consented to be viewed. And that's another point I just want to highlight, and the board may be well aware of this, but these records are, are in this, the information is in the system and to the point about security. It's just whether the other providers who are taking care of you can see it. So if we think we want, you know, your primary care doctor, your specialist, um, your ho the hospital, if you're, you know, hospitalized on an emergency basis, to be able to see this information and that that is for the good of the health of our state, um, I, I, uh, we, our members would like to see a change in this direction. So thank you for the work of, of DIVA. We really, we do um, support the presentation today. Sure, Mike Smith, the interim uh, president and CEO of Vital. Uh, I do also want to thank Diva for their all the work that they uh, put forward. We supported the study. We also support a change in consent policy, and let me tell you the reason why. Currently, uh, medical prov providers can only uh, access a minority of Vermonters records here in uh, Vermont. Changing the policy would mean that they'd be able to access a majority of the uh, patient reg records in Vermont with all the safeguards that are in place. I, I've heard a lot of the things, and I heard Michael talk about kicking the can down the road. And many of you know I don't like to admit mistakes, um, but I made a mistake in 2006. I kicked the can down the road. I wish we would have addressed this issue in 2006 when the VHI was established 
and we went to an opt-out policy uh, during that time. I think it has hindered the progress of the VHI over this uh, many years. You know, I've heard some talk about a communications plan, and I think that's critical, by the way, if we go to this policy on a communications plan to make sure that all people know what's going on. And I, I'm committing vital to work with DIVA to establish a communication plan that will uh, reach out to people on this change of policy. I've also heard statistics about other states. You know, when we talk about six million in uh, Florida, for example, that's six million on 21.3 million of people. That's about 28 percent. That's not, that isn't success in my mind. We've had success, and I want to address that. We've had success this year because of uh, what has happened with the Green Mountain Care Board, integrating sort of the budget process with uh, the consent policy, electronic consent policy that we implemented a year ago. That con consent policy has had um, success in terms of elevating from 19 to 38 percent uh, for consent. I have testified in front of the Green Mountain Care Board. I firmly believe that will plateau at some point. We are going to be at a point where it's going to plateau, and that means that we've had success up to a point. In order to gain further success, I really believe that the opt-out policy is the, uh, is the policy to proceed. So I thank DIVA for all their work. I do agree that we need a communication plan that incorporates uh, some of the fine comments that have been made here. And uh, I would urge the board to uh, approve a change of policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Other members of the public? If not, Jess, I think you had a question. Yeah. Well, actually, I was going to ask, well, I was going to ask you, but I wasn't sure if you'd be able to answer, but I was going to ask about the, the impact that the board's decisions around the hospital budget, asking each hospital to uh, work with the, I mean, work with uh, vital around electronic consent had had any impact. So I think you answered that. So thank you. And I actually just want to um, say that one of the things that I love about being on the board is the public comment that we get. So I just really want to be um, appreciative of Deb and Sam and Kirsten, Dale, Susan, your comments around the impact that you see it. And I hear you. So I just want to let you know that I'm listening and I hear you. And you know, I can read the literature and, and think about things from a behavioral economist kind of perspective. But I hear what you're saying, and it, it causes me to think. So I just want to thank you for that. So thank you, everyone. Um, very uh, thought-provoking conversation, and uh, um, we look forward to how the report is uh, received uh, in the legislature, and I'm sure that this will be a topic at some time in the future that we will be discussing again. So thank you, Michael and Steve. At this point, we're going to... Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to briefly mention that we will do our best to uh, reflect the additional comments that we heard today in, in our report and account for those in our recommendation. So at this point, the next item on the agenda is the Household Insurance Survey, and um, we'll give a couple minutes as we invite the new panel down. <laughs> Uh, forward to uh, this presentation. Um, it's always very helpful to see um, what percentage of Vermonters uh, actually have insurance and the other problems that we face in that area. So if you could start just by uh, introducing yourself and um, whenever you're ready, proceed. 
Right. Uh, I'm Jesse Hammond uh, with the Health Department. I'm the Public Health Statistics Manager. And I'm uh, <laughs> Uh, Paul Meadow, I'm an epidemiologist and public health analyst with the Department of Health. Um, so I, we're sort of splitting the presentation into a couple of different pieces, and um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background and introduction, um, as well as start to talk about the results. Um, but the health department took on implementing the household uh, Health insurance survey with the 2018 um, version of the survey. Previously, it had been implemented by the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, so, in some ways, this was a really interesting and unique opportunity for us to work on a project where um, the content isn't necessarily something that we focus a lot of our efforts on. Um, we do a lot of surveys and data collection, so that's sort of the angle that we're coming from. Um, but the um, the, the why part is a little bit trickier for us, um, and we would uh, defer to some of our other partners. Um, and this has been a really great opportunity for us to work with some of the partners in, um, in state government uh, that we don't necessarily get to work with often. Um, so that all said, the Household Health Insurance Survey um, has been done since 2000. Um, and one other thing I should say, with the health department taking it on, we tried to keep a lot of the methodology uh, similar for comparison's sake. Um, and we also used the same data collection contractor that it had been used in the past who has uh, great knowledge and expertise in um, data collection, but also in um, health insurance type surveys specifically. So they were a great asset to us in um, completing the survey. Um, this year's version was conducted, data was collected from February through June of 2018, um, and we reached 3,000 households and um, about 7,193 people. Um, it was a random digit dialed cell phone, uh, survey, excuse me, on cell phone and landline telephones to make sure that we captured the, the full population. Um, and then um, the data were weighted using, uh, to be representative of all Vermont residents. Um, and something that's a little bit different than had been done in the past, uh, we, in presenting the results, suppressed data where the unweighted numerator, so the number of respondents, was less than five and or the denominator was less than 50. Um, this hadn't necessarily been done in the past, but the health department, this is a fairly consistent policy for the health department. Um, it both protects, protects confidentiality of any respondents, um, and also when sample sizes are small, results can be more variable, so it helps uh, protect the quality of the results as well. Um, so first, just talking about overall insurance quality, or insurance quality, insurance coverage. I don't know anything about quality. <laughs> um, um, so since 2005, um, uh, the insurance uninsured rate has gone down um, by more than half. Um, in 2018, 3% of Vermont residents were uninsured, um, according to the survey. Um, during that same time, we, uh, the proportion of the population that has private insurance has decreased, um, while those covered by public insurance sources like Medicaid and Medicare has increased. Um, you know. It, um, in terms of uh, numbers of people, um, about 19,800 are uninsured, 329,800 have private insurance, um, 136,900 have Medicaid, 121,100 have Medicare, and about 17,000 have military insurance. Um, and then we also can look at the data not just by what the primary source of coverage is, but looking at all combinations of types of coverage. Um, you know, even with the decrease towards less, or the decrease in coverage by private, still 53% of Vermont residents have private insurance only. Um, a quarter have Medicaid only, um, less than one in five have Medicare only, and few generally have um, any combination of more than one type of insurance. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
looking at insurance coverage by geography, um, most counties reported an uninsured rate of two to four percent. Um, in this iteration of the survey, Lamoille County was the outlier and has an uninsured rate of 11 percent, um, which is statistically higher than the state. Um, I should also note that due to small sample sizes, Essex County and Grand Isle County were not uh, reportable. Um, but you can also look at um, not just the uninsured rate, but looking at private um, insurance where Chittenden County has a uh, significantly higher rate of residents covered by private insurance, whereas Caledonia and Orleans County um, are statistically lower. Um, somewhat correspondingly, Orleans has a higher rate of Medicaid coverage, while Chittenden County has a statistically lower rate. Um, and Franklin and Orange counties have higher rates of military insurance, um, while Chittenden County has a lower rate. Um, in these first few slides, there's a couple mentions of uninsured, or underinsured, excuse me, and we'll talk more about that in more detail later. Um, but generally, that those are residents whose policy leaves them vulnerable um, it would, due to either current medical costs or future ones should a serious medical condition occur. Um, but Addison County has a higher rate of underinsured. Oops. Um, making a little bit of a transition here to talk briefly about health savings accounts. Um, among Vermont residents 18 to 64, um, those with private insurance, uh, there's similar proportions of these residents, whether they are have private insurance, are underinsured with private insurance, or not underinsured, um, similar proportions of people have health savings accounts. Um, and then when you look at um, contributions to their health savings accounts, those would be those are also similar, um, but uh, not necessarily unexpectedly <coughs> underinsured would have have a higher deductible. So uh, now we're going to move into talking a little bit about um, the uninsured uh, specifically. Um, and we can see here that the rate of uh, uninsured Vermont residents um, has gone down over time, like Jesse mentioned earlier. Um, the rate of underinsured in 2018, un, uh, sorry, uninsured um, in 2018 was similar to, t um, statistically similar to the rate in 2014, but it was statistically lower than 2012 and earlier. Looking at uninsured by um, demographics, um, we can see here in the graph that the uh, trend of uninsured by um, sex has also gone down over time, um, but males um, were consistently more likely than females um, over all years to be uninsured. Um, and then there are about 10% of Vermonters uh, who are uh, 25 years old um, to 34 are uninsured, where 5% um, of those 25 to 44 were uninsured, um, and 6% of those uh, whose income is between 151% and 251% of the federal poverty level um, are uninsured. And we're going to get into those last two a little bit more detail. So this shows the uh, trend in uninsured by age for those under the age of 65. Um, and overall, from 2005 to 2018, there's been a significant decrease in the rate of uninsured among all age groups. And looking at uninsured by um, federal poverty level, um, the rate of uninsured uh, Vermont residents with incomes of 300% of the federal poverty level or less, uh, so the uh, top three groups in the graph there, um, I had a significantly decreased the rate of uninsured since 2005. Looking now at some numbers around uh, employment, um, the uninsured rate among employed uh, adults um, 18 to 64, you can see that number has also uh, gone down over time. Um, the rate in 2018 was uh, statistically similar to 2014, but it was um, statistically lower than previous years. Uninsured rates are highest among Vermonters uh, who are self-employed. 
um, and 8% of Vermonters who work at companies with less than 50 employees um, are uninsured, and just about 3% of those who work for larger companies um, are uninsured. This is looking at the availability of employer-sponsored insurance among insured uh, workers. Um, and there has not been any statistically significant changes in the proportion of uninsured workers uh, who indicate their employers um, offer a health insurance plan. This is uh, giving a little more detail on the rate of uninsured by uh, employer um, uh, size and employers with higher numbers of employees tended to have uh, lower rates of uninsured. <coughs> so now uh, we're going to look at um, interest in state health insurance programs. And a majority of uninsured uh, Vermonters are very interested in enrolling in uh, state health insurance programs. You can see that um, just over half um, indicated that they were very interested. And then another 25% um, uh, are somewhat interested. 40% uh, of uh, Vermonters believe state health insurance programs are too expensive, um, which is their main reason for not enrolling in um, state health insurance programs. And another 21% uh, believe that they are um, not eligible for state health insurance. Um, and then um, there are far fewer people indicated uh, that it was too much trouble, um, that they had a problem with the application deadline, um, or that they have applied but are, are waiting to hear back. Among the uninsured, now looking at the length of time without uh, having insurance, um, a majority, 53% uh, of, of um, um, those without health insurance, ha have been without it for less than a year. Um, and then a quarter have been without health insurance for more than five years. Now looking at some uh, people's reasons for not having insurance, um, we're going to start by looking at the importance um, of cost and not having insurance. Um, and half of the uninsured indicated that cost was the only reason that they did not have health insurance. Um, and another 22 percent uh, indicate uh, it was one of the main reasons. Um, significant decreases. Um, there has been a statistically significant decrease um, as cost being the absolutely only reason uh, for not having insurance since 2005. Um, and the uh, increases in some of the other categories seen from 2014 to 2018 um, are not statistically significant. So continuing to um, look at reasons for not having health insurance, um, we can see that a third of um, uninsured indicate that they have lost eligibility or are not eligible for state insurance. Um, and then a quarter indicate that they can no longer afford um, employer-sponsored insurance. And then slightly fewer indicate that someone in their family lost a job, um, and that was the main reason that they lost their um, health insurance. And then about um, a quarter are simply not interested in having insurance. So now we're going to talk uh, a bit about the underinsured. So underinsurance is a status that threatens individuals in a similar way to uninsurance. Um, while an underinsured individual um, has an insurance policy, the policy may not be robust enough um, to, uh, to either cover current medical expenses sufficiently or leaves the individual and or the family in danger of excess medical expenses. Uh, should a serious uh, medical condition or illness uh, emerge. Um, underinsured individual, individuals have um, insurance coverage, uh, so are not taken uh, into account in traditional measures of insurance status. However, um, if the root problem of uninsurance is excess exposure to unaffordable medical expenses, uh, the underinsured are often um, equally at risk. So to define underinsured, um, these are persons that have an insurance policy, but like I just mentioned, the policy isn't su um, sufficient to cover their current or potential future exp uh, medical expenses. 
we identified these individuals um, by estimating using um, the Commonwealth Fund methodology. Um, and the link to that methodology is on the slide and can also be found in the report that is available online. Um, and under their methodology, uh, underinsured um, is either of the following um, either current medical expenses uh, excluding insurance premiums are equal to or greater than 10% of the household income if they're at 200% of the federal poverty level or higher, or um, the, uh, it's 5% of the household income is uh, less than 200% of the FPL, or the deductible is uh, greater or equal to 5% of the household income. <clears throat> So the reasons um, more, uh, th this is looking at the reasons underinsured uh, for being underinsured via the uh, Commonwealth Fund criteria. Um, more insured Vermonters face uh, significant de deductibles and out-of-pocket uh, costs or other medical expenses. Um, and this rising uh, cost to income disparity has led to an increasing number of Vermonters being considered as uh, underinsured. And we can see here that um, <coughs> Overall, 36% of Vermonters can be considered underinsured according to the Commonwealth Fund criteria. Um, and similar proportions are un, uh, un, underinsured because of either their deductible or their out-of-pocket expenses. And 7% are underinsured uh, due to both categories. And among those with private insurance, 40% uh, are considered underinsured, 21% uh, uh, because of deductible, 8% due to out-of-pocket expenses, and 11% due to both. So now looking at the actual rates of uninsured um, over time, um, we can see that uh, among all residents less than 65 uh, years of age, th um, a little over a third um, have indicated are uh, underinsured and um, all residents with insurance, that number is um, very similar at 37 percent. And then um, all Vermonters less than 65 years old with private insurance, um, it goes up to 40 percent, so not a lot of variability. I'm going to look um, at some of the demographics related to um, the rate of underinsured. And we can see here that from 2014 to 2018, the rate of underinsured Vermont residents um, has uh, significantly increased uh, for both males and females. But males and females are both uh, underinsured at similar rates. So underinsured by age. Um, 18 to 34 year olds are significantly more likely to be underinsured um, than Vermont residents overall. Um, all other age groups are statistically similar to the statewide rate. So looking at underinsured by um, federal poverty level, uh, the rate of underinsured uh, Vermont residents living at less than 200 percent of the federal poverty level has significantly decreased um, from 2014 to 2018. Now we're going to talk a little bit about um, health care utilization. Uh, so um, Vermonters with insurance are more likely to uh, generally have received service or sought uh, care in the last year across um, all measures, which included visiting a doctor in the past 12 months, receiving a uh, routine medical care, visiting a specialist, uh, visiting an emergency room. Uh, receiving mental health care or counseling and receiving substance abuse treatment. Um, you know, this is likely influenced by age and other factors, um, given that the um, uninsured population tends to be younger. Um, but it should also be noted that this re reflects care sought, nece not necessarily care needed. So um, the uninsured, um, as we're we'll going to see in just a minute, um, are more likely to delay care, so they may. Um, uh, even they're not seeking as much care, but it doesn't mean that they don't need it. Um, which we'll see that on the next slide. So this is just looking at the underinsured versus not underinsured. Um, very little difference um, in terms of seeking care. Okay. Now looking at care delayed in the last uh, 12 months due to cost. Um, <coughs> excuse me, um, the uninsured 
in the um, converse to the previous slide about um, seeking care, the uninsured are more likely to delay care across all categories. Um, which included dental care, routine medical care, metal, medical care from a doctor, a diagnostic test, prescription medications, or mental health, health care or counseling. Um, seeking or delaying care due to prescription, or for, excuse me, for prescription medication and mental health care, those differences were not statistically significant. Um, I should also say that over time, the difference between the uninsured and the in insured has decreased. Um, the proportion of the insured population delaying care has remained steady over time, while the proportion of the uninsured seeking care, or delaying care, excuse me, has decreased. So fewer uninsured are delaying care over time, but there still is a disparity as compared to the insured population. Um, looking at the underinsured population and delaying care to, due to cost, um, I, it, you know, similar results on the, to the other slide that the underinsured are um, more likely to de delay care than those who have insurance that are not underinsured. Um, it's looking at out-of-pocket medical expenses. Um, <coughs> Uh, those who are insured are more likely, uh, almost three quarters of them, have paid more than $500 in out-of-pocket costs in the last year for medical care, um, while only six in 10 of those without insurance. Um, <coughs> and that, um, again, is likely influenced by age differences, um, that those with insurance um, need more care, so they may have more out of, end up with more out-of-pocket expenses. Um, and the difference is consistent across each of the types of out-of-pocket costs that are asked about, um, including dental and vision, where a third of insured and um, three in 10 uninsured um, residents have paid more than $500 in out-of-pocket costs. Um, prescription medications, where it's 22% and 17%. Mental health, where it's five and four, and then all other medical costs, where a, th a third of the insured population has paid more than $500 in out-of-pocket costs. Um, with the underinsured, um, eight in 10 of the underinsured population, 18 to 64 with insurance, has paid more than $500 in out-of-pocket costs in the last 12 months. Um, those who are not underinsured, um, it's only 63% um, and similar disparities across the individual categories. We're looking at medical um, impacts of medical bills. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, for the uninsured versus the insured population, the only difference that is statistically significant is problems paying medical bills, where 30% of those who are uninsured reported having difficulty paying medical bills in the past 12 months, um, compared to 17% of the insured population. Um, this difference also has uh, decreased over time, um, but all other difference, uh, all other differences between these populations are not um, statistically different. Um, if we look at the trend, um, there's really been significant strides in redu uh, trends in. Um, Med paying medical bills over time among the uninsured specifically. Over time, since 2005, there's really been significant strides in reducing the um, proportion of these residents who have problems paying bills and who have been contacted by collection agencies, where um, for in 2005, 40% of the uninsured said they have had problems paying medical bills, um, and this year it was only 30%. Um, and in terms of being contacted by a collection agency, that is reduced from 33% to 20%. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for the looking at the underinsured population, um, those who are underinsured are more likely than those who are not underinsured to have had problems paying bills, um, collecting, being contacted by a collection agency, um, and have to have used all or most of their savings to pay medical bills, or to have had a. Um, or unable to pay for basic necessities due to medical bills 
However, even in, for this category, both the underinsured and the um, not underinsured is small. Um, there are no statistical differences in um, having a person in the home receive a single medical bill for more than $500 that had to be paid out of pocket or having large credit card debt. Um, with the underinsured population, there's not as much of a trend because we haven't been collecting that information as long, um, but we still have seen significant improvements um, from 2014 to 2018. Um, particularly in the area of um, pay problems paying medical bills. And if you all have any questions for us. Great. It was uh, a lot of information thrown at us in a very short period yes, of time. Yes, sorry. Fast um, talking. <laughs> but that was very good. Um, and there's some really good things to take away from this as far as our insured rate. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, is something that we can be very proud of. When you look at the underinsured, you start to get a little bit more worried. So my question is on the um, questions in the survey. Mm -hmm. um, once someone um, responded that they um, had a high deductible policy, was there a follow-up question asking if there likewise was a savings account provided by their employer that would um, help them in that situation? Um, I don't remember the specific order of the questions. Um, I can certainly, we can certainly get that. Um, <clears throat> the, there, there was the health savings account question, um, but I don't know that it was specifically tied to um, the first question you mentioned. So were the answers to the second question deducted from the answers to the first question and determining the underinsured rate. I'm just trying to make build some confidence. Right. That it's so, are, so, so let me make sure that I understand what you're asking. So, if they have a self health savings account, were they not included in the underinsured question or category? So, yeah. The question is, yes, they have a high deductible, mm -hmm. but um, if there are other resources made available to them by their employer. Do they then get deducted out of that uh, that uh, uh, count of underinsured? I don't believe so. No. Okay. But I, I can confirm that. But my understanding of the way the it's calculated is no, they are they are still included in that. Okay. Thank you. Questions from the board. Tom. <clears throat> Thank you for this. This is uh, going to be a, definitely a document that you go back. To. Uh, back to a number of times um, uh, as it's actually very complex in a way um, so I, I had my questions kind of I had like six questions so I think they're pretty brief <laughs> but I have lined up off your report okay and then I'm trying to align them with the uh, <clears throat> with the uh, uh, slideshow and I think I got it but um, the, the, um, we'll find out so I'm looking <coughs> at slide four and I'm just wondering, um, over time, uh, VCAT and Catamount existed uh, during this period, as do the Vermont Health Connect plans. Um, and so in terms of, of were those treated similarly uh, uh, in this slide? So, you know, but, and I don't you know, know the original surveys, but was, was um, VHAP a private insurance? You know, there's subsidies, but there, was that classified as private? Was Catamount classified as private? And, is, and are the Vermont Health Connect insured classified as private? I can actually answer that for 2014 and before, if that would be helpful. That would be. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, VHAP was in previous surveys, uh, which would have been 2014 and before, because the 2014 results were based on 2013 right. survey. Uh, that, that was categorized as Medicaid because it was run by the Medicaid program. Catamount was categorized as private because the underlying insurance was a private insurance plan and it was administered by Blue Cross and MVP. And uh, Vermont Health Connect in their survey? I would assume Vermont Health Connect plans would be private, but I would defer to the Department of Health. Um, I'm just trying to think through. I would have to check. I believe they're private, but I just need to check. 
Um, the next one was slide 13, I think, I'm hoping. And uh, I, I just couldn't make the connection myself. It's probably obvious, um, but I couldn't find it. I'm interested in the self-employed mm -hmm. and the 7%. Um, and, and I'm, what, that's 7% of what? I'm, I'm interested in the number of self-employed people who are uninsured. So does that mean you're looking for what the denominator is? How many people are self-employed? Yeah, 7% times X uh, gives you the number of... Uh, yeah, um, I don't believe, I don't have that with me. I don't know off the top okay. of my head how many people fall into that category, um, unless you remember. Um, we can check. Yeah, there's there's no rush. It's yep. just, I thought, if, if, if you knew. Mm -hmm. The next slide would be um, slide 19. And I had circled um, the lost, the kind of strikingly different increases in, from 21% to 34% for mm -hmm. those lost eligibility, not eligible for state health insurance. And I'm wondering if what lost eligibility means. Could that mean lost eligibility because they um, passed through the 300% subsidy level and 400% subsidy level <coughs> uh, for um, for my Health Connect policies or mm -hmm. what? what what? So some of it is up to the respondent to determine. So it could have been that they moved across that threshold and no longer eligible. There may be other eligibility requirements that they feel they no longer meet. Um, you know, this whole, these all these responses, and we should have mentioned this, is the respondent's perception. So it is possible the person is would still meet the um, would still meet the requirements of the state health insurance program programs, but for whatever reason, they no longer feel that way. And there were substantial eligibility changes in terms of the rules between 14 and 18 because of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the changes in Medicaid. So that's yep. probably a confounding right. mm -hmm. issue there. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just interested in those nuances is when I look mm -hmm. at this data, is mm -hmm. it, how much of, of it is apples yep. to apples? and. You know, there clearly is, in my view, a very severe benefits cliff once you get beyond 400% of poverty. Um, and I'm just wondering whether it's, it's, it's the subsidy that was the driver of, of the decision uh, to forego insurance as opposed to... Uh, I'm not sure there's enough specificity in the question to be able to answer that. Okay. Let's see, going to slide uh, 22. I'm just curious as to this underinsured population, um, <laughs> ages 64 and under. Um, <clears throat> is uh, is this you know a measure of actual uninsurance that they that 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 during the year uh, they breached the thresholds that you have from the Commonwealth, or is this a kind of projected uninsured? Um, uh, where you know, in, where in fact the, the owner of the policy uh, never spent the deductible or the percentages of income you know, that you're trying to measure. But so it is based off of um, the respondents are asked what their deductible is, um, and then they're asked about all of their out-of-pocket expenses. Um, so from those responses, those are collated, um, and then an so, underinsurance so it's rate. It's actual, based. It's yeah. actual experience. Yes. Well, can I clarify? Because the Commonwealth definition defines under insurance as greater than 5% of household income if your deductible is that amount, regardless of whether or not you've used it. Correct. So it, it's both, there's two different tests. One test is, is your usage over a certain amount? The other is just by definition, is your deductible okay. too yeah. much of your, uh, greater than 5% of your income? Right. Yes. Sorry. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, let me down the home stretch here. <laughs> I, just, uh, I think it's slide 28. Um, I was just interested to see that, um, <clears throat> for example, the visiting to the emergency uh, room, that the insured visited the emergency room proportionately more than those uninsured. And I guess mm -hmm. I was just under the impression, probably falsely, that that uh, it was the uninsured that used the emergency room a lot, uh, whereas those with insurance could, you know, have better health care and, and, and avoid that. But the 
this doesn't seem to affirm that. <coughs> Um, yeah, I mean, all I know is what the result is. I can't speak to why those differences might actually be there. Um, it's, I mean, essentially, there's no statistical difference, so um, the rate of visiting the emergency room is not different um, statistically, but, um, you know, there may be something related to perceptions around how much you might have to pay um, if you're un uninsured um, that might keep them from seeking that care unless it's more of an emergency. And finally, I, I couldn't find the associated slide, but on page 40 of the actual report is um, the calculation that there are 3,900 lives um, <coughs> greater than 401 percent of poverty. Um, and uh, so, uh, so of, of the uninsured, I think there was like 19,800 uninsured, 3,900 of those were uh, um, you know, at, at, at a level of greater than 400 percent of poverty, yep. um, and is, so, but it, that's still kind of a small segment of the sample. I'm wondering if if you have a sense of what the margin might be around that 3,900 number. No, I don't have it now, but we can pull that and let you know. Thank you. Any other questions, Robin? You can go ahead. I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say, as the person who foisted this survey onto you or got the <laughs> legislature to do so, thank you very much. You did a fabulous job. Thank you. And now I'm glad to know who's responsible for hoisting it onto you. Have somebody else start your car, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just also wanted to comment on the underinsured. If you look on slide 22, and this is kind of going to where um, I think Kevin's point was, which is 40% um, of the people in private insurance Mm -hmm. um, are looked at as underinsured. And I know on a separate slide, I think there were, I know, I know they're not one for one, but about, I think, 34 35% have HSA accounts. And I'll give examples, you know, in the um, uh, corporate world of saying, you know, someone could make $100,000 and they have a $5,000 um, high deductible plan. So in that case, they're hitting that 5% threshold. Yet the company's providing four thousand in their mm -hmm. HSA, and, and they're really just out of pocket the thousand dollars. So, right. it's just—I mean, it's just a point of right. Maybe. It is, um, and just certainly we've been talking with the, the with Diva about how to explore this population further. Um, you know, I met with them last week to discuss additional analyses that we plan to do to try and understand the relationships here better. Yeah. And I think another shift looking at the decline in the people who are not insured anymore, right, mm -hmm. which went down, you know, significantly and correlating a little, unfortunately, to them becoming probably underinsured, but mm -hmm. it's probably better than not having insurance at all. But I mean, it's like the right. shift there, too. There's a pretty close right. correlation to that number, too. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I just have a quick question on slide 25, um, which was, again, I guess we're all intrigued by the underinsured. Um, this is by age, so I was just wondering if you could unpack a little bit with third of Medicare recipients who fall into the category <coughs> underinsured, which of the triggers would have made it such that somebody on Medicare would be underinsured? Third. Um, I don't remember whether we explored that by age specifically to look at what the specific reasons. Um, if I had to guess, I would probably say it's more related to the out-of-pocket expenses. Um, but I would have to confirm that before committing okay, to that. I'm just curious. It seems high to me, given that mm -hmm. obviously yep, no, I a agree. lot of out-of-pocket expenses and pharmaceuticals. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of potential reasons. I was just curious. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was my question. Just related to Jess's question, uh, I wonder if there's some way to get at that by looking at the previous numbers about uh, where people have double insurance. Because my guess is if you don't get med sup, which some people can't afford to, that even the deductible piece of it could trigger it because you're, well, you're mostly paying co-insurance though, so maybe that's not true. But I, I think that would be, one, part of my question is, I wonder how many, and this may not be, you can't, might not be able to figure this out in the survey, but I wonder how many of that 32% have met up. Okay. okay, are there questions or comments from the public? And again, um, address your questions or public or, or comment through us, Deb. 
Yeah, my question was uh, the definition of underinsured from that one slide, uh, mm -hmm. you used in the Commonwealth definition, but it didn't include insurance and premiums, and yet uh, a lot of my patients pay their own premiums, which would put, it seems to me, kick more patients into that uh, mm -hmm. underinsured uh, category or the whole issue of co-insurance. And I'm, I'm wondering how that was addressed. Uh, and some people don't aren't even sure how much they're spending how much they're paying into their insurance premium by their employer. I quite honestly don't know. I partially paid. I know it's in the parking. I'm not sure if somebody asked me that question. I didn't really answer. And I'm thinking that there's probably even more underinsured as a result. Uh, are we, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't really have a great answer. Um, I. It certainly could be more. Um, we, I, this has been part of our conversation with the folks at Diva, and we'll continue to explore that. Um, and I would defer to them more. Um, we used a definition that um, had been used in the past and has been used by some by a fair number of other organizations, um, but it, it, it does not include premiums. Okay, deal. Um, on th on this slide. No, sorry. Oh. I had a question on the next slide. I didn't want to move to that slide. So. Oh, do you um, mean the delayed care? Yeah. In fact, more for the beginning of the show tempo, but you know. Yep. Um. It is possible, and I would have to check that. Um, we had had vision in the past, and it just wasn't asked in this year. There, it, it's possible that we change the questions um, this year, and it would be included again in the future. Okay, well, I only find that concerning because those are the ones that are often the riders, the mm -hmm. policies, and so forth. Something we really have no idea. Yep, very good point. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Dale. Twenty-five, This is just a snapshot in time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. that they can only give us so much and it's not giving us a more significant detailed picture that could be related. Yeah. Okay. Jessa, did I see your hand up earlier?
have an answer for that? Um, well, so the question is whether subsidies are factored into it. Um, I don't believe so, but I will confirm. Okay. Um, other comments or questions from the public? Well, you can see that there's a lot of uh, interest in, the, in this study, and uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it was fascinating as uh, you proceeded with this. We look forward to some clarifications. And, uh, right. It's very useful information. It's something that I think everyone has known for a long time that we've had a problem with underinsured in Vermont, and uh, this tends to confirm it. So thank you. Great. Thank you. So we're going to uh, switch gears again, and the next uh, discussion is going to be the ACL certification. Um, and Mike, and Melissa, and Marissa, if you could come down and change the uh, slide deck and proceed. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Mike Barber. I'm joined by uh, Marissa Melamed and Melissa Miles, and we're here today to talk to you about um, our, our staff analysis of One Care Vermont's continued eligibility for certification. Our agenda is pretty simple for today. We're going to start by going over the background, providing some context for our review. Then we're going to summarize the findings from our review and present recommendations regarding OneCare's continued eligibility for certification. We're going to focus on the new ACO certification requirements that the legislature enacted in 2018. And finally, we're going to have some time at the end for questions and discussion, hopefully. So getting into the background, um, under 18 VSA 9382, an ACO has to obtain and maintain certification from the Green Mountain Care Board if it wants to uh, receive payments from Medicaid or a commercial insurer under the all-payer ACO model or any other payment reform program or initiative. The board was charged with um, adopting administrative rules that establish standards and processes for uh, ACO certification and with ensuring that it only certifies ACOs that meet certain statutory requirements. So uh, the board did this in enacting uh, Rule 5. Uh, rule 5 sets out uh, standards and processes for, for certifying ACOs as well as reviewing and approving their budgets, as, as you know. So uh, I'm sure you remember, but you provisionally certified OneCare on January 5th, 2018, fully certified them on March 21st, 2018. Given the fact that we have a uh, pretty in-depth annual budget review process for ACOs, Rule 5 does not require an ACO to reapply uh, for certification each year and undergo the kind of uh, intense review we did um, in, in the earlier part of 2018. Instead, once an ACO is certified, it has to submit a form to us each year verifying that it continues to meet the requirements of the statute and the rule and describing any material changes in the ACO that may affect its uh, continued eligibility to, to be certified. An ACO's certification remains valid while the board's review is pending 
if during the board's review it determines that an ACO is failing to meet one or more of the certification requirements, uh, the board may require remedial action, including placing the ACO on a corrective action plan. Um, this is the first year that we have undergone this kind of review, review process. So we developed a form specifically for One Care to complete that was tailored to the types of information that we got from them during the initial certification process. Um, after One Care was certified, uh, the legislature added to the ACO uh, certification requirements. So in addition to asking One Care kind of in the forum what's changed in their operations. We also ask them to um, answer questions that would help us understand whether they are complying with these new certification requirements. Just to quickly review our timeline, uh, the staff presented the 2019 certification eligibility verification form in June uh, and a memo with the new ACO certification statutory criteria was presented in July. Um, together those made up the 2019 certification form, which was voted on and adopted by the board on August 1st, uh, transmitted to OneCare, and OneCare then submitted their responses, uh, uh, sorry, uh, October 1st, uh, same time as the budget submission, so we were reviewing those simultaneously. Um, with uh, question and response period. And today we are at our 2019 staff recommendation. There'll be a period of public comment from today through the 17th of January. And um, there is a potential vote scheduled for the 23rd. So the staff analysis and recommendations are outlined in a detailed memorandum to the board, which is posted on our website under the ACO materials. Uh, so first I'm going to give you a summary of all of our recommendations, and then next Mike, Melissa, and I will review our support for the recommendations as we provided in the memo. This is should be somewhat briefer than the memo, there are additional details. Um, posted in that document. And the memo is divided into three sections, um, background and an overview of our recommendations, and then discussion on the certification, the new certification requirements, and discussion on the annual eligibility verification. So for an overview of our staff recommendation, first I'll address the new certification uh, requirements. For the new requirements, staff conclude that the um, those that were added to the statute are being met. Um, this will require a board vote since they're new. We recommend the, vote, the board vote to approve One Care's continued eligibility for certification subject to reporting and monitoring requirements for those new requirements, and we'll review each of those reporting and monitoring requirements in the discussion slides to follow. Uh, and uh, the new requirements are outlined here, mental health access, fair and equitable payments to minimize differentials among participating providers, often referred to as pay parity, and addressing childhood adversity and promoting resilience. Our second recommendation is regarding certification eligibility verification. As Mike mentioned in his introduction, after the initial certification, one care is required to annually submit a form describing any material changes, and our recommendation for those items are here. First, the board approved antitrust guidance after that initial certification. That was approved in May of 2018. One care attested under oath in their October 1st uh, certification submission that they're in compliance with the board's guidance. So no board action is required to continue certification on, for this item. Second, One Care submitted their certification form describing changes since the 2018 certification process. Um, highlights from their submission, which are outlined again in more detail in the memo, include review of leadership change leadership team organizational chart and board of manager roster changes, review of the patient and family advisory committee charter, improved mechanisms for consumer input, update to the participant appeals policy based on 2018 board review, development of the 2020 network, 
uh, and several population health management and care coordination items. Uh, after our review, staff conclude there are no changes that affect OneCare's continued eligibility for certification and no board action is required to continue certification. Um, in addition, just to note, in their submission as part of regular monitoring and reporting, OneCare agreed to submit the following documentation to support these items um, and support our ongoing monitoring of certification criteria. And they will be reported as part of their quarterly reporting submission. The board is required to vote on One Care's compliance with new certification criteria that was added in 2018. So Mike and Melissa and I will review our analysis and recommendation for each of those. Okay. Um, so the f the first of the new uh, criteria has to do with access to mental health and the board has to ensure that uh, an ACO ensures equal access to appropriate mental health care that meets the Institute of Medicine's triple aims of quality access and affordability in a manner that is equivalent to other aspects of health care as part of an integrated holistic system of care. We looked at five factors to determine whether one care is meeting this criteria. Uh, we asked OneCare to describe its role versus the payer's role in supporting access to mental health care. We asked them about the financial incentives they provide to support access to quality mental health care. We asked uh, about their care coordination efforts. We asked what other kinds of programs and initiatives they're engaged in on this issue. Uh, and then finally, we asked how they use data or facilitate the use of data in support of these goals and how they include mental health in their quality measurement and clinical priorities. <clears throat> and I'll go over briefly as I can um, essentially what they said and, and kind of our analysis of it. So the first question, as you can imagine, OneCare explained that they are trying to integrate mental and physical health care services by providing resources, tools, and supports to enable integrated care teams from across the continuum to more easily identify people with mental health issues, prioritize their needs, and connect them to needed services as part of a, a shared care planning process. And uh, they stated that payers are responsible for designing benefit plans that facilitate access to mental health services and ensuring parity of coverage and network access. Regarding financial incentives, uh, OneCare described how they are making per member per month payments to designated agencies and other community providers to enhance their capacity to provide team-based care coordination to high-risk and very high-risk individuals the preponderance of which, a uh, preponderance of whom, excuse me, OneCare estimates have a mental health condition. Um, they also stated that they are planning to work with mental health providers in 2019 and 2020 to explore new payment models and delivery system reforms that will improve access to timely, high quality mental health care. <clears throat> As you know, they will be developing a specialist payment pilot in 2019 and issuing community innovation grants. And they will have to report to us on these programs later this year as part of the um, budget order. Um, however, we recently received uh, OneCare's, or reviewed OneCare's request for proposals for the Innovation Fund, and I just wanted to note that they are asking for proposals that could relate to this criteria of uh, improving access to mental health. Specifically, they're seeking proposals that will improve access to care, improve mental health and or substance use disorder prevention, screening and or treatment, advance care coordination for high-risk individuals through innovative programs that address social determinants of health and that eliminate inequities in health. With respect to care coordination, OneCare talked about uh, how Care Navigator allows providers to identify uh, individuals with mental health diagnoses, such as anxiety, depression, and bipolar disorder, and has provided a common consent and redisclosure process to help ensure that care team members uh, subject to Part 2 regulations can participate as active team members. As you know, Part two uh, regulations govern the confidentiality of substance use disorder data and have sometimes served as or at least been perceived to be a barrier to 
um, better care coordination for individuals with substance use disorders, uh, many of which also have co-occurring mental health conditions. Uh, also, we think that the um, comprehensive payment reform pilot uh, turning into a program in 2019 may allow independent primary care practices to more effectively incorporate behavioral health and psychiatric care into their practices. Uh, we just received a status update from OneCare on their 2018 pilot, which is now posted on our website, uh, which describes uh, among other things, how the Thomas Chittenden Health Care Center was able to use increased financial resources that it received under the pilot to hire a psychiatric nurse practitioner two days per week and provide psychiatric services to patients lacking health insurance coverage. Uh, One Care explained how that project began in March of 2018 and for the period of June through September, uh, the practice was able to increase access to a mental health professional by 80%. We will be getting a final report later this year on the 2018 CPR pilot, where we would expect to hear more about these kinds of uh, clinical innovations that are being allowed or facilitated by the pilot. <clears throat> With respect to other programs and initiatives, One Care mentioned uh, how they have funded a full-time mental health clinician through the Howard Center to support residents at two Burlington congregate housing locations where SASH has programs. Um, they mentioned that they uh, have hosted a, a grand round on uh, suicide prevention and are partnering with the Blueprint for Health to dedicate an all-field team meeting to the issue of suicide. Um, they noted that the uh, uh, Diabetes Prevention and Management Learning Collaborative, which is a joint effort between One Care, Department of Health, Blueprint for Health, SASH and a regional quality improvement organization is going to be focusing its final session uh, this year on connections between diabetes and prediabetes and mental health and wellness. Okay. And then on the last issue, uh, one care mentioned how they are working with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont to share aggregate HSA level data on some key mental health and substance abuse quality measures with their network. They mentioned uh, that they have been working with the Department of Vermont Health, health Access on a department-wide process improvement plan to improve the initiation and, and engagement of substance abuse disorder treatment rate for Medicaid beneficiaries. And then in terms of uh, quality measurement, they noted that a number of their quality measures relate to mental health and substance abuse, and that one of their clinical priority areas for 2018 uh, was related to mental health. And we will want to uh, make sure that they continue to incorporate mental health into their 2019 quality measures and clinical priorities, obviously not only because of this certification requirement, but also because uh, it's important to meeting our performance targets under the all-payer ACO model. So on this criteria, you know, based on our review, we believe One Care is uh, working within its role as an ACO um, to ensure that its attributed patients have equal access to appropriate mental health care as part of an integrated holistic system of care as required by the statute. We recommend that the board um, continue to monitor OneCare's performance on mental health related quality measures in its payer contracts um, and also review its 2019 quality improvement plan and, and clinical priorities to ensure that it is including mental health and prioritizing mental health in those areas. Um, we also recommend that one carer be required to submit a report regarding its collaboration with the DAs on a part two common consent and redisclosure process. I think we'd like to understand more how that's working, if they're seeing increased data under that, uh, and if so, how that is um, being used to better uh, serve patients with um, substance use disorder and mental health conditions. Okay. 
So on the issue of payment parity, the um, existing statute read the ACO has established appropriate mechanisms to receive and distribute payments to its participating health care providers, or sorry, that was the, the previous, and the language that was added is in a fair and equitable manner, and to the extent that the ACO has the authority and ability to establish provider reimbursement rates, the ACO shall minimize payment so shall minimize differentials in payment methodology and amounts among comparable participating providers across all practice settings as long as doing so is not inconsistent with the ACO's overall payment reform objectives. So the board has been examining this issue since 2015 when the legislature first required us to report on it. I last presented to you on this issue in August of 2017 after a stakeholder process um, and a memo that was sub submitted from the board to the Health Reform Oversight Committee examining this issue. That was in October of 2017. And then this language is the result of discussions on the topic during the 2018 legislative session. So to evaluate this criteria, we looked at two factors to determine whether um, OneCare um, met the new requirements. One, the ACO's role versus the payer's role in creating fair and equitable payments and minimizing payment differentials. And two, the ACO's steps to minimizing payment differentials. <coughs> So for number one, uh, OneCare has two mechanisms for making payments to providers. Uh, one, the all-inclusive population-based payment model, where participating providers waive fee-for-service and accept a lump sum prospective payment on behalf of attributive lives according to their contract with the payer. The fund source is from the payer based on uh, historic fee-for-service revenue and is set in payer contracts. Second mechanism is direct supplemental payments made on top of usual fee-for-service or the AIPBP model. These payments are also set in provider contracts and the fund source is budgeted by OneCare and includes hospital and payer contributions to OneCare. These payments allow hospital and payer contributions to OneCare to be redistributed to independent and other community providers. Uh, OneCare does have the ability to set the payment methodology and supplemental population-based payments. Uh, OneCare does not have the ability to set the underlying fee schedule negotiated between payers and the providers. Mm -hmm. The second factor we looked at was the steps the ACO takes to minimize payment differentials. In 2019, uh, OneCare will make payments in three ways, through fixed payments to hospitals, capitated payments to independent primary care providers, through the Comprehensive Payment Reform Program, and Population Health Management Program payments. The Comprehensive Payment Reform Program is the most direct program implemented by OneCare to help minimize payment differentials between hospital independent primary care providers. It was piloted in 2018 with three organizations and is expanding in 2019 to nine organizations. It's the, the three um, returning and six new. The CPR program makes progress toward minimizing payment differentials by implementing a payment reform option for independent providers that is simpler and more predictable revenue stream and allows for clinical flexibility and innovation. It invests in primary care. It applies the same methodology to generate payment amounts across all providers. Um, by, so each practice in the CPR program starts from the same base PMPM and then practice specific age, sex, and risk adjustment is applied. The payment methodology is designed to provide a transition to value-based reimbursement models, incentivize, incentivize focus on population health and wellness, and facilitate long-term participation in ACO programs and enable sustainable operations and meet the goals of the all-payer model. So this is not, incon not inconsistent with healthcare. Uh, reform. And as Mike mentioned uh, just a couple of days ago, we received a status report on the CPR program. The report does not include the final financial results for the 2018 pilot, but the final results were requested in your recent budget order. So those will be um, available. So OneCare did report the following financial results on the CPR pilot program in June and presented this uh, to the board in July. So this is just a reminder um, that the table is directly from their report. 
The table shows per member per month for CPR participating practices modeled in three ways. Uh, non One Care Vermont model in the first column, the standard One Care Vermont model, and then the comprehensive payment reform model, compared with the model for hospital primary care practices in the fourth column. The report does show favorable results for CPR practices, however, as one care mentioned in their presentation report as well, this is only includes two months of claims, um, and, and our conclusion or our um, assessment is that you know there are favorable initial results from the pilot. Plus, it's promising that there are additional practices that have joined in 2019, um, which is why the board requested that additional reporting in the 2019 budget. So we believe that this reporting. Um, and the results that we see that we've seen so far satisfy the criteria. So just to summarize the certification recommendations for payment parity, um, staff observed that one care is currently working within its role as an ACO to establish appropriate mechanisms to receive and distribute payments to its participating health care providers in a fair and equitable manner and to minimize payment differentials. Uh, and again, as as part of the budget, the board the board voted to require final reporting on the 2018 comprehensive payment reform pilot and interim reporting on the 2019 comprehensive payment reform program. And we recommend that these budget conditions that you already voted on also satisfy monitoring for this certification requirement. And this is the language that was voted on as part of the budget order. Okay, so for the final area of new certification items that were um, granted by the legislature, uh, we looked at addressing childhood adversity and promoting resilience. Hold on. Um, the ACO provides connections and incentives to existing community services for preventing and addressing the impact of childhood adversity. The ACO collaborates on the development of quality outcome measurements for use by primary care providers who work with children and families and fosters collaboration among care coordinators, community service providers, and families. For the statutory criteria, we examined the connections between ACO providers who are addressing the impacts of adversity, the collaboration on quality outcome measurements, and then incentives for community service providers. In looking at connections between ACO providers to address impacts of childhood adversity, we asked OneCare um, to describe how they're working with stakeholders who are tasked in the existing legislation, Act 204. Some of those stakeholders are listed here. So, um, OneCare described that they have a population health strategy committee that directs the ACO's clinical initiatives in cooperation with state insurers um, and the community organizations. They described that their board members on the Population Health Strategy Committee work with community leaders from across the continuum of care, and these include um, primary care, home health, DAs, the Vermont Food Bank, but it also includes the UVM Health Network Chief of Population Health, the Vermont Commissioner of Health, and the Vermont Child Health Improvement Program Leadership. In addition, they have a pediatric subcommittee that's comprised of academic and community pediatricians and family physicians. So in 2019, they stated that they would have a, um, increased focus on childhood adversity, engaging with the Agency of Human Services, the Blueprint for Health, Vermont Care Partners, and their participant network to create cooperative interventions that are multifaceted. And by example, this year, One Care has met with the Agency of Human Services and the Department of Children and Family Services staff to explore interventions for children who are attributed to One Care and also in DC CF custody. Um, they also referenced existing work that they're already performing to provide connections to providers who are addressing adversity, which include their complex care coordination program, their shared care plans, and care navigator, which permit, permit medical and community agency personnel to target childhood trauma contributors. Uh, One Care also has extensive involvement in the community collaboratives and the regional clinical represent, uh, representative funding, which we reviewed during the budget process. 
The second area that we looked at was collaboration on quality outcome measurements. So they stated that several in the OneCare network are exploring efforts to develop a childhood adversity screening tool that network providers could incorporate into their own electronic health records. Um, they gave the example that the Middlebury HSA is testing uh, a tool called the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths scoring tool. Um, secondly, they are contracting with a data vendor to look at the health and prevention of the entire community. And um, it's, they're building a risk scoring algorithm with public and proprietary data to identify social determinants of health in that community, which may place children and families at an increased risk for adverse childhood experiences. And this neighborhood or household stress risk score would be accessible in care navigator for their providers and would be combined with their Johns Hopkins uh, risk grouper. So it would be able, they would look at, be able to look at social needs as well as medical needs. They've also stated that the use of this analytics will help them to identify cost and utilization drivers, which may help justify additional resources to address social determinants of health. So they're beginning with a pediatric pilot, and then they would expand it to adults and older adults based on those findings. Finally, um, I would also note that they have two clinical priorities that could address social determinants of health as well. One is a wellness priority to engage all patients in their annual wellness visits. And also they have a food and security network or measure that is being implemented across the network where networks are identifying how to increase access to food in their own communities. So the third area that we looked at were incentives for community service providers. Um, OneCare highlighted that they are collaborating with the Vermont Department of Health to roll out um, the evidence-based uh, program DULCE, which stands for Developmental Understanding and Legal Collaboration for Everyone. So I looked, uh, I did some research because I was curious about the evidence base of Dulce, and it actually began as a randomized control trial in Boston in 2010, and then it was spread to six national sites in 2016, of which Lamoille County was chosen as one of those sites. Um, and the model is that the Lamoille County Parent Child Center employs a specialist who is then embedded at their local federally qualified health center pediatric practice. And that person works with families who are enrolled at the parent-child center to support them in receiving enhanced social and medical services during their first six months of life. And then, in addition, Vermont Legal Aid provides the legal assistance to the enrolled participants in the program. So to continue this expansion for Vermont, one will provide financial assistance for a statewide program coordinator and will also provide funding to continue research to test the program outcomes. Um, they're expanding to three new pediatric practices in uh, 2019 who also have a Rise Vermont campaign. So this is our certification recommendation for OneCares uh, regarding their childhood adversity and resilience. Um, we observe that they're currently working within their role as an ACO to provide those connections and incentives to existing community services, collaborate on the development of quality outcome measurement, and to foster collaborations among care coordination, community service providers, and families. We would recommend that OneCare provide a timeline to address their 2019 plan, um, which would include uh, you know, reporting back to us on the creation of new social determinants of health risk scoring, how the screening tools are being incorporated into the electronic health records, um, the rollout of the dual site program expansion, and finally, how OneCare will use their analytic capacities to identify the cost and utilization drivers to help justify additional resources for childhood trauma and any additional initiatives OneCare may be starting. And now we'd like to open it up for discussion. Hmm? And uh, what? public comment is through the 17th? Correct. Yes, so this is the, um, the next steps are that we have a public comment open period from 1-9 to 1-17, and then we are on the board meeting agenda for the 23rd to uh, provide any 
public comment discussion and also our um, a potential vote pending the conversation today and through the public comment period. Any questions or comments from the board? Tom. I have, I have a, just a couple. Um, one in regard to the payment parity. Um, and I'm uh, reading the charge here. The ACO shall minimize differentials in payment methodology and amounts among comparable participating providers across all practice settings, etc. I'm just wondering um, if and if so, how does payer mix factor into this? Um, uh, because different providers are kind of faced with different financial wins depending on, on who their payers are. Um, we know we have huge cost shift issues uh, in Vermont. I don't expect the ACO to mitigate those, um, but as much as possible, because if you did, um, that force is out of the barn, but um, but in terms of the ACO, um, is there any um, thought about that being a variable in figuring out how to um, make payments uh, in a more equitable way? Well, I would probably have to think that through a little and perhaps ask one care um, how the pair mix is factored into their methodology. Um, I don't know if yeah, I would just say that at least with the the payment the comprehensive payment reform pilot for independent primary care, um, kind of what they're trying to do is have a a portion of the, the per member per month payment be a replacement for fee for service. So what you're currently getting in fee for service, we're gonna replace that on a fixed basis and then add on kind of what you would get, what you are expected to get with our additional program and then add some more money to that. So to the extent they're re replacing the fee for service, I think that kind of builds in probably the, the mix you're talking about and on the hospital side, which is the other payments they make, um, you know, the, the all-inclusive population-based payment that they're getting from Medicaid and from um, CMS is basically, the ex we expect this much money to be spent at hospitals for this population for the year, and so it's, again, a replacement, uh, and then OneCare is taking a portion of that to redirect towards these other programs that they have. So. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's how I, I think about payer mix and what they're doing. I, I guess I just finalized the question by asking if you can ask one care, is payer mix a factor in how they uh, propose or how they do redistribute, redistribute um, the additional payments uh, above and beyond just replacing or replicating um, you know, Collective fee for service payment. And then my, my other question was, and I know Peter. I think they're ready to answer you if you would like it. I think they're ready to answer you if you would like it. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. So just to confirm, Mr. Barber's comments. So a, a provider who is handicapped, let's say, by a payer mix that's you know, heavy, heavily Medicaid, for example, um, that, that the, the, the across the board fixed payment doesn't seek to remedy that at all. It's, it's a more just a equi equitable So it's the rates that we set are not adjusted by payer or things like their coordination or population health management. It's the rates that are set by the state and much larger Medicaid population and therefore attribution is higher, they would get a higher payment related to care coordination for those individual lives than say their I see, so it, so it, it is driven by attribution to a extent. Okay. And the other, um, thank you for that. I, did, I didn't know you were here to answer questions. 
Um, thank you, Kevin. You know this the best. And the other uh, I have is um, having to do with the granularity, if that's a word, of these neighborhood or household stress risk scores. Um, I do see in the recommendation is how ACES screening tools are being incorporated into the uh, electronic health records. Um, but I guess I would like to know more as we come down toward a vote as to how granular the scoring system is because it seems that that uh, these risk scores are um, maybe not the neighborhood score but the household score might be incorporated in people's um, electronic health records. Um, yet, you know, they are kind of being crafted by this, you know, Algorex Health, you know, the, the highway, uh, you know, the consultant helping with this. And I'm, I'm just, I just want to make sure that uh, in terms of, uh, of um, the patient's consent or awareness of that, that it is being responsibly handled. And um, I don't know if Sarah, you want to talk about that because we did chat with them about, um, about this, so. Sure. So there are two distinct strategies for us right now to really explore the space around how we can better understand the um, availability and access of data related to social media and health and bring that into a broader definition of health overall. So when it comes to the actual screening information, these are pilot tests that are going on in individual sites or hospital service areas. So for example, uh, at the University of Vermont Medical Center in the pediatrics communication and outpatient program, they've adapted a CMS um, evidence-based tool, and they're actually asking it directly of patients and candidates and collecting that in the electronic health record. That is not data that we have accessible to us at one care right now. We're really just trying to foster those pilots to learn from that process and figure out from an ACO strategy how it might be best have a statewide approach to that type of screening. In parallel, we recognize that all of the work that we put into our care coordination program is limited by the fact that we know people's health is impacted so much by those circumstances, and yet our risk stratification, our, our initial attempts to identify individuals who might best benefit from care coordination really takes medical complexity and utilization of services into account, and not some of those other factors. So what we're trying to do is test some ideas around, can we have a rolled up score that brings in the data that is um, publicly and, and through some proprietary means available to us. And our goal would be if this case uh, passes some validity checking, which includes things like asking our providers to compare what they know about individuals and families with what this information is telling us at a summary level, then leaving that together, could we actually integrate a risk score that does a better job? So that's my point, is that um, that this is uh, a kind of a, uh, a growth of healthcare and the social determinants of health are, are, are valuable. And, and uh, I think we all can agree on that. I just want to, but now that it's being applied um, at a very micro level, at the patient level, uh, I just want to make sure that the patient understands, you know, why they're being asked these questions. and. And once they get a risk score, to have maybe the risk score explained to them. Um, and I, I know that this is preliminary at this point in time, and maybe all the nuances of that question can't be answered today, but it, it, it's something that um, I think needs consideration as we move forward. I could just respond. I think you bring up an excellent point in some of the work we do over the next nine to 12 months. It's really around the patient and caregiver engagement in our care navigator tool. And as we work through our patient and family advisory committee and other participants in our network to really understand how is that information accessible, what's perceived, how do we inform and engage in that process? So much to know. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from the board? If not, I'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Dale? The idea of risk assessment, the 
Sarah, do you want to take a crack at it? <laughs> so, big picture, you know, we're in the very early days of thinking about how we could use social determinant of health data to better provide services. So there's lots we don't know. But I think there, there are two aspects for me there. One is certainly there are surveys and screening tools and assessments that get at things like bullying that are really important for something we need to encourage buyers to make sure that we're types of information, we think about the screening for social determinants of health that body of work, we really look to what is the literature, what the evidence tell us, um, our statements. And so there are broader concepts, things like, um, was the parent or child incarcerated? Um, has there been homelessness? Are there um, mental health or other issues? And we have to provide the list of what the evidence tells you. Interestingly, the school dynamic doesn't come up from that risk lens. I think where there's tremendous opportunity on the other hand is to engage school nurses and others in the parenting and do that parent to child and family that we want to see as opportunities for this And this is another question. I'm not just being hurt. I do question that. Hopefully, times have improved. But if they were like what I experienced, that won't work. <laughs> that just won't work. There's things that can happen in the school system. Even reaching out to the school nurse. I'm not sure she she had an idea, but she she had no idea how that it was. Um, one to measure. Okay. Yep. Other public comment or questions? Not the same. Mm -hmm. So um, again, public comment period through the 17th. Um, anyone can go to our website and uh, uh, share their comments with us. And the 23rd, correct? Correct. We will be looking to um, take a vote. So, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Drive safely. Thanks.